Uh, welcome to the Landmark Chambers webinar, Land Acquisition Setting the Strategy. My name is Neil Cameron and we're delighted to see that so many of you are joining the session today and hope that you will find the presentations and discussion to be both useful and informative. I'm going to begin with a few housekeeping points. Your microphones are automatically muted, so you will not need to adjust your local settings. We very much welcome questions throughout the session. Please submit questions in writing via the Q&A section, which should be found at the top or bottom of your screen. Uh, we're going to listen to the presentations and then uh, we will answer questions. The webinar will be recorded and you will receive a link to the presentation and the recording shortly after the event concludes. Now, if your connection is lost at any point uh, during the webinar, uh, we do invite you to rejoin the meeting and you do that by clicking on the original link again. I'm going to chair the session today and I'm going to be joined by our guest speaker, Ian Cunliffe. Ian is a chartered surveyor and head of the infrastructure development team at Gately Hamer. And he's worked on some of the most significant infrastructure projects in the country, including Hinkley Point C, HS2, and over 20 DCOs advising from the auctioneering stage through to appearing as an expert witness and no doubt beyond. Uh, so we're going to hear from Ian first and then we're going to hear from David Nichols who's a specialist property law barrister at Landmark and then from Matthew Henderson whose practice covers a wide range of specialisms including uh, planning and compulsory purchase. This is the first in our session, first session in our series uh, delivering major infrastructure. And with increasing emphasis on infrastructure projects, the promoters of those projects and those who are affected by them will need expert advice. And what we intend to do with our webinar series is to give an overview of the issues that will need to be considered from the very early stages right to the end uh, when compensation and other issues are considered, which may take many years to resolve. In this webinar, uh, we intend to cast some light on the issues which need to be considered right at the beginning uh, when setting the land acquisition strategy. As I've already said, we're fortunate to have Ian Cunliffe as a guest. He's going to give us a surveyor's view and I'm going to be interested to hear from Ian how he thinks surveyors can best be involved at an early stage. Often the engineers may have designed a wonderful project, but it can only be delivered if the necessary land can be acquired. We will then take advantage of Landmark's combination of property and planning specialists by hearing from David and then from Matt. David will address land and rights to be acquired and Matt will speak on how compensation issues should be considered at an early stage. So just a reminder, please submit your questions as the talks progress using the Q&A function and we will then discuss as many of them as we can. Uh, so that's enough from me and I'm going to hand over to Ian. Good morning everyone and thank you Neil for your introduction and thank you to Landmark for inviting me on to speak this morning. Um, there we go, up, up and running. Thanks very much again. Um, so this morning what I want to touch on is um, the land acquisition strategy and the importance of it um, and as Neil suggested from a surveyor's perspective. What we're looking to try and ensure we deliver is the, is the land when it's needed um, in a cost-effective manner. But to get to the point where you're delivering the land you need to overcome two key hurdles. Uh, one is the consenting hurdle and the other is the compensation hurdle. Um, so when you're looking at a land acquisition strategy, those, those two key 
uh, hurdles need to need to be considered within their land acquisition strategy. So this morning, what I'm going to look to do is just review quite briefly the obligations on applicants looking to secure compulsory acquisition powers. Um, look at what goes into um, a, a land acquisition strategy. Discuss the benefits of early engagement. Touch on what sort of agreements you might look to to enter into with with landowners. Um, look at how you might manage the land work stream and then just briefly touch on one or two lessons learned. So as a first starting point, if looking at the compulsory purchase and critical down rules um, guidance from MHCLG, it's absolutely essential that there's an understanding that unless you can demonstrate as, an, as, a, as a central acquiring authority that you have an understanding of how land is going to be used and, that, and, how, and why you need to acquire it, and that you also have the necessary resources, i.e. financial resources, to, to, to secure the acquisition of that land, it is unlikely that you are going to be granted compulsory acquisition powers. You also need to demonstrate that there are no other further impediments to, to, to securing the land that you need, such as you need to ensure that you have a, a programme that takes into account any infrastructure works needed for accommodation works or remedial works that need to be undertaken. And also you need to consider what planning consents might be needed. And within that, I think not only do you need to consider any consents that is needed for the scheme you're promoting, um, but also whether or not there's any further consents that are required for such, such as relocating facilities. So you can only really understand those sort of issues if you properly engage with landowners at an early stage. So we'll talk further about optioneering later in the presentation. Specific to DCOs, the Planning Act guidance um, and also the, the statute itself sets out some compulsory acquisition tests for um, applicants looking to secure a development consent order that need to be overcome. Um, first of all, the land that you're seeking to acquire, you need to make sure that that is actually development as, as, as made clear in section 122. You need to be confident there is a compelling case in the public interest for the land to be acquired compulsorily, which will hopefully be set out in, in your statement of reasons. There are no reasonable alternatives to compulsory acquisition, so looking to secure land by agreement, but also modifications to the scheme. Are there any modifications that would have a lesser impact? That needs to be considered and demonstrated. You need to be able to demonstrate that the acquisition is necessary and proportionate, and the land to be acquired is no more than is reasonably required for the purposes of the development. And again, within the Planning Act guidance, applicants should seek to acquire land by negotiation wherever practicable. As a general rule, authority to acquire land compulsorily should only be sought as part of an order granting development consent if attempts to acquire by agreement fail. So looking at all of those elements, Quite a lot of positive work is often undertaken uh, by project managers or stakeholder managers engaging with landowners at an early stage and building relationships. But it's only really by looking at those requirements can you, can you pull together a strategy to understand how you're going to overcome those challenges. So whenever we are instructed on a project, we like to ensure that, um, that those issues are recognised, those challenges are recognised and they're addressed in a, in a land strategy. So the first stage of the strategy is, is understanding what the land challenge is going to be. So what land is required and what rights are needed? What are the number of landowners? And what is the cost going to be? So you undertake an initial land referencing exercise to understand those aspects of, of, the, of, of the land challenge. Also critical to demonstrating that you're, the acquiring authority is gonna have the necessary resources to secure the land by, uh, to secure the land it needs is a property cost estimate that needs to be undertaken. And once you've got that, that basic first bundle of information, it's important to report back to the client, understand what their requirements are. Have they got an appetite for early acquisitions? What is their preferred method of acquisition? And what is their governance requirements? So if you're um, going out to negotiate with landowners, what processes need to be undertaken um, to, to ensure that, that those agreements can, can, uh, can be continued and, 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 and resolved. Once you've captured those elements, it's important then to look back at the consenting 
requirements of the specific regime under which you're trying to secure, uh, cons secure consent. Is your strategy going to satisfy the compulsory purchase test? And are you reducing the risk? Then finally, looking at land delivery, the strategy that you've got in place, is that going to deliver the land when you need it? Are you going to be able to wait until you've got consent or are you going to have to look at uh, being a bit more adaptable, looking at alternative ways of, of securing land at an earlier stage? You've got to try and manage the compensation liability. What is the best way of going about that? And also, whatever you're doing needs to have an idea of, of engaging with the contractor procurement process and making sure that any agreements are cascaded through into that process so that they're captured appropriately and don't introduce risk at the later stages of the project. So when you've considered all those elements, and this isn't an exhaustive list, but it's, it gives you an indication of what would go into the strategy, then, you, then you've got your final strategy. Do you need to have an alternative property cost estimate? because you want to do something which is over and above the compensation code? Do you need to introduce discretionary schemes because your project is going to have um, introduced significant blights? And are there any other key risks such as uh, human rights risks or equality impacts which need to be addressed through the strategy? Once you've got that, that should give the client a clear understanding of the process that is going to be undertaken and, and what the key deliverables are going to be. But also importantly, it gives the instructed uh, surveying firm the mandate to go out and engage positively with landowners and that's the next step taking engage taking the, the project into the real world moving it from the desk onto the land understanding what the key issues and engaging in genuine optioneering to de-risk the scheme are you are you looking at modifications to the scheme if you look at them if you if you if you've made changes have has that been properly documented? If you can't make changes to your scheme equally, you need to document that so that it can be uh, relied upon when you get to examination or inquiry. You've got the opportunity by going out and optioneering with, with, with landowners to understand how businesses may be affected. And that will give you the critical time necessary to ensure that if there's additional planning consents required or if there are going to be very complex issues that need to be undertaken, that you're not trying to do that in a finite period of time through inquiry or examination, but you've got the appropriate lead in time to address those issues. Through this process, you're, you're pulling together an audit trail of, of, of engagement and demonstrating your efforts to engage positively with landowners. And it should all come to a position whereby prior to you submitting your application, you're looking to get terms out for an agreement. That demonstrates that you've got an understanding of what the issues are and you've looked to resolve them. And that can be in, in any, for, any appropriate form, option agreement, a land of works and agreement, or in the absence of those, if you're looking at a DCO, a statements of common ground. What you want to be able to do is demonstrate that you've worked positively with landowners, you understand the issues and you've tried to resolve them. How do you manage the land work stream? Um, government guidance advises that applicants should appoint a specified case manager during the preparatory stage to whom those with concerns about the acquisition can have easy and direct access. And this, this is uh, a positive initiative for applicants looking to secure compulsory acquisition powers because what it does is build consistency consistency of a relationship with affected landowners but also reporting back into the project team and then when you're getting to the examination stage you have got all the information there through that consistent relationship to understand and present those, those, those points of view and the issues that have arisen through your engagement. As it's about an acquisition, um, the suggestion would be that surveyors are, are, are well placed to adopt the role of case managers. Um, and, but how do you know that those surveyors are appropriately qualified? Well, the RICS uh, issued in 2017, the RICS professional statement, which was surveyors advising in respect of compulsory purchase and statutory compensation. And this sets out 20 behaviors that must be satisfied for surveyors acting in, in the world of compulsory purchase and compensation. Now, they don't necessarily need to satisfy all 20 of those, but they need to satisfy the ones of, 
which are relevant to that instruction. So what that means is that acquiring authority is instructing a surveying firm. If they're, if they're signing terms in accordance with this professional statement, they know that they're getting an appropriate advisor to take them, take them through this process. And equally important for claimants who are affected by compulsory acquisition proposals, they know that the surveyor that's going to be appointed, if they're signing up in accordance with this professional statement, that they have got the, the requisite advice to ensure that, um, that they're going to be well represented. And if a surveyor isn't signing in accordance with this, then they shouldn't be acting in matters of compulsory purchase and compensation. So just a, a few lessons learned. The key one, resource. If you're um, an organisation whose business as usual isn't promoting large scale infrastructure schemes, then you must ensure that you've got the appropriate resource um, available from the outset, again, in respect of surveying, um, acquiring authorities and, and claimants can take comfort from the fact that uh, the professional statement says that not only do you have to have the, the appropriate uh, expertise to undertake the instruction, but you also have to have the appropriate resources uh, to complete the assignment within the time scale under the standard required, but absolutely critical to ensure that you have the resources necessary to deliver the project from an early stage. Otherwise, you might find that your programme was stretched or that um, you, you, you risk potentially undermining relations with external stakeholders. Agents fees can also be a bit of a prickly subject. So it's important to understand within your strategy, what is your approach going to be to that? From an early stage, acquiring authority, authorities may look to go out and undertake surveys and there's a, often a lot of pressure on, on, on the delivery of those surveys because they're subject to seasonal windows. So understanding what is your approach going to be to uh, land agent fees um, at an early stage is really important. Um, they should be in accordance with the RICS professional statement, um, but good agents acting on, on behalf of claimants will help de-risk your scheme um, if they understand the context of those negotiations and are providing appropriate advice and they're willing to work towards an agreement, then um, they, they can be a positive aspect of, of negotiations. But it's important that whatever fees agreement you have in place, you're not funding objections. And then the final point, uh, perhaps person at the moment, given the current environment, is prepare for delay. Recognise what the impact of your scheme is going to be. Have the resources to address it, i.e. discretionary schemes. If your project is going to deliver a significant amount of uh, blight, it's important that over a long period of time that uh, discretionary schemes are in place to ensure that that, that, that blight is addressed and that um, undue uh, hardship isn't, isn't felt by those parties affected by your proposals. But also understand obligations uh, in respect of the Equalities Act and the need to show um, reasonable adaptations to your existing policies to ensure that, uh, um, that those responsibilities are met. So I think that's my quick run through and it's over to David. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, the focus of my presentation this morning is described as uh, deciding on the land and the rights to be acquired. And when preparing a, a strategy for the acquisition of land, there are a number of aspects that should inform that decision making process, which are summarised on the slide and which will form the structure for this talk. First, identify what land is required and the purpose for acquiring it. That will help inform a decision about the nature of the acquisition. Secondly, consider whether any land may be required to mitigate the effects of the development. Thirdly, the possibility of agreement as an alternative to compulsory purchase should be looked at. Fourthly, there may be uh, special considerations for land in certain ownership, such as land held by statutory undertakers. Fifthly, there may be particular considerations for special categories of land and I will deal with each of these five elements in turn. Uh, first, it's important to recognise that an essential part of the approach to developing a strategy for land acquisition is the asking and, and of course the answering of questions, simple open questions, who, what, where, when, how and why. Constant interrogation of any incipient proposal in the early stages 
is a key element in developing a serious, effective, and ultimately successful strategy for land acquisition. And as we shall see, these question words return again and again. As you know, compulsory purchase is the acquisition of land without the consent of the owner, a serious invasion of proprietary rights, but justified on the basis that the public interest outweighs the landowner's private law rights. Without the power of compulsory purchase, any entry onto the land and its subsequent development would amount to a trespass and a nuisance. And of course, these draconian powers mean that a compulsory purchase order should only be made when there's a compelling case in the public interest. So an acquiring authority must exercise some statutory power in order to compulsorily purchase land. The starting point is to examine what powers are available for that authority. The next stage is to consider the purpose for which the land is to be acquired and to identify what land or interests in land are required to achieve uh, that purpose. Uh, justifying the acquisition may not be possible if too much land is included, but if too little uh, is included, achieving the objective may not be possible. Uh, a more difficult question is whether the freehold or leasehold title is required or whether some lesser interest uh, would be sufficient. Uh, so what is land? Well, it's important when putting together a land acquisition strategy to understand the nature of the estates and interests in land uh, that is to be acquired. Now, the, the definition uh, in the Acquisition of Land Act uh, and the Compulsory Purchase Act is not terribly illuminating. And in some authorising statutes, there is no definition at all. And in those circumstances, the Interpretation Act 1978 may fill the gap. Schedule 1 defines land as including buildings and other structures, land covered with water, and any estate interest, easement, servitude, or right in or over land. Uh, and there's also a definition in the uh, Law of Property Act. Uh, the Royal Property Act is significant in helping assess what rights and interests in land may be acquired. It distinguishes between the legal freehold, the legal leasehold, legal interests in and rights over land, and equitable interests in and rights over land. The first two, the freehold and the lease, leasehold, are both estates, and that means that they give a right to possession of the land. In contrast, legal or equitable interests or rights do not give a right to possession but merely give rights over someone else's uh, land. An acquiring authority will usually wish to acquire the greatest legal estate in land, being uh, the legal fee simple, absolute in possession, or as we know it, the freehold. Often lesser estates may have been carved out of the freehold, and the acquiring authority may wish to acquire these as well. But it will need to ensure it has the statutory power to do so. And if there is a power to acquire a leasehold, then upon acquisition of both the freehold and the leasehold, the leasehold will merge with the freehold. An alternative is to consider acquiring the freehold and then allowing any leasehold interest to expire by a fraction of time, provided uh, that possession of the land is not required until those leases have expired. Consideration should also be given to whether the permanent acquisition of land or rights can be justified or whether temporary possession or the temporary acquisition or exercise of rights over land may be sufficient instead. Occasionally the authorizing statute may specifically grant power for the temporary possession of land. For instance, the acts passed for the construction of the Dockins Light Railway provided for the temporary taking of possession of certain land and a similar power is contained in section 32 of the Railways Clauses Consolidation Act 1845. A recent example is the Midland Metro order relating to the Birmingham tramway, in which there is per per uh, permission to take temporary possession of certain specified land, to remove any buildings and vegetation from that land, to construct temporary works there, and to construct authorised works. The powers exercisable on notice, either 14 or 28 days, and the temporary possession is limited for a period of two years. Otherwise, the owner's agreement is required. All temporary works must be removed uh, before giving up possession and the land restored to the reasonable satisfaction of the owners plus compensation paid. There's also power under the Planning Act 2008 for land to be taken on a temporary basis. This act provides a mechanism for granting consent for nationally significant infrastructure projects by means of a single consent, the development consent order. And an applicant may include a power to make temporary use of land for carrying out or maintaining the authorised project. 
But more usually, the authorizing act will not grant a specific right to take temporary possession of land. And if there is no specific power, then temporary rights may be acquired by agreement. Failing agreement and acquiring authority may have to acquire the freehold in the relevant land uh, and give a written undertaking to return it as surplus land at the end of the temporary period. Uh, finally, as part of any strategy, it would be prudent to consider whether the provisions of the Neighbourhood Planning Act 2017 have yet been brought into force because when effective, uh, these will confer a power on acquiring authorities to take possession of land uh, by agreement or compulsorily. Uh, when acquiring land, authorities have certain obligations they must consider, including mitigating the scheme's impact on the environment, such as designated landscapes or protected species. It may be desirable to mitigate against all environmental impacts, which is why HS2, for instance, has taken additional land for compensatory habitat. Land may be acquired to mitigate the effects of public works in three circumstances under Section 26 of the Land Compensation Act. There is power to acquire land by agreement in order to mitigate any adverse effect which the existence or use of any public works will have on the surroundings. Uh, there is power to acquire by agreement land whose enjoyment will be seriously affected by the construction, alteration or use of public works. And if public works are going to be carried out on blighted land, then there is power to acquire uh, land by agreement which will be seriously affected by the carrying out of the works. Uh, and in addition, there's a power to carry out works on land belonging to the authority or purchased under Section 26 for the purpose of mitigating an adverse effect, which the construction, alteration, existence or use of any public works will have on their surroundings, which may include the planting of trees or the laying out of grassland. And a highway authority has power to acquire land under the Highways Act 1980, with the purpose is to mitigate the adverse effects of the existence or use of a new or improved highway on the surroundings. The power may be exercised compulsorily prior to the highway being open to traffic, otherwise by agreement within one year of the opening date. And the highway authority may also use this power to acquire land to exchange for a common open space or allotments. And I'll say more about land of that particular type in a few moments. Just having a little trouble getting my slide to move on. Hopefully you have a, a slide that uh, deals with reaching agreement, sorry for that slight hiatus. Uh, if not, you'll just have to listen to me without seeing a slide. Um, so moving on to reaching agreement, compulsory purchases, of course, intended as a last resort to secure the assembly of all the land needed for the implementation of projects. Uh, the acquiring authority will be expected to demonstrate that they have taken reasonable steps to acquire all of the land and rights included in the CPO by agreement. But it's important to clearly ascertain that there is power to acquire land by agreement. Uh, most statutory provisions which confer compulsory purchase powers now also confer the power to acquire the land by agreement, but that is not uh, universally the case. An acquiring authority may negotiate and contract to purchase land by agreement in one of three broad circumstances. First, on the open market, well, that is straightforward. Secondly, through negotiations, uh, but with the insurance of uh, relying on compulsory purchase powers if the negotiations break down. Uh, I think you now have a, a slide back on your screen. Um, there we go, we're on, we're on this slide. So first on the open market, very straightforward. Secondly, through negotiations but with the insurance of relying on compulsory purchase powers if the negotiations break down. However, potential downside here is that an acquiring authority who waits for negotiations to break down before starting the process may lose valuable time in doing so. Uh, and therefore it will often be sensible just to start the compulsory purchase process because there's still thirdly the possibility of a purchase voluntarily during that process. And of course, whichever route you adopt, it's always important to remember to carry out negotiations on a subject to contract basis. Uh, now moving on to the uh, next slide in relation to reaching agreement. The benefits of acquisition by agreement are that it allows for a greater level of flexibility between the parties in terms of timing and consideration, giving the affected parties sufficient time to identify, secure and relocate 
to alternative premises will allow for the mitigation of potential disturbance compensation. Other benefits include certainty in terms of both timing and cost. But a limitation of this method is that agreement is only effective uh, where there's a willing seller, where an owner of a property interest does not wish to sell, but will only reach agreement on unrealistic terms, then acquisition by agreement cannot be achieved. Another potential difficulty is that a purchase by agreement will not enjoy the benefit of any provision in the authorising act, for instance, extinguishing adverse third party rights, and there'd be no obligation in the voluntary purchase for the authority to bear the conveyancing costs of the seller. My enthusiasm, I've pressed the button twice, there we go. So, in preparing a strategy for land acquisition, you should ask who owns the land. This is because special considerations arise where the land in question is owned by particular categories of landowners, including statutory undertakers, local authorities and the National Trust. Such land is afforded some special protection against compulsory purchase and the CPO in relation to such land may be subject to special parliamentary procedure. I make particular reference to statutory undertakers. They are defined in Section 8 of the Acquisition of Land Act and include transport undertakings such as rail, road, water transport, but not private bus and taxi firms operating under license, docks, harbours, lighthouses, the sea, civil aviation authority, the National Air Traffic Services, and universal postal service providers, as well as other bodies such as utility providers who are deemed to be statutory undertakers. And section 16 of uh, that act provides that where land comprised in a CPO includes land acquired by the statutory undertakers for the purposes of their undertaking, then the undertakers can make a representation to the appropriate minister. This has the effect of preventing the CPO from being confirmed until the minister is satisfied that either the nature and situation of the land means that the land can be purchased without serious detriment to the undertaking or if the land is purchased but then replaced by other land, that this would also not cause serious detriment to the undertaking. Uh, alternatively, the statutory undertaker may object to the CPO and it will then be subject to a special uh, parliamentary procedure. In both cases, the land must have been acquired for the purposes of the undertaking and not for purposes not directly connected to the undertaker's statutory functions. In the absence of a certificate from the minister or the withdrawal of the representation, the CPO will not be confirmed. Finally, it's important to consider how the land is currently used or categorised. Just as the identity of the landowner may give rise to particular considerations, so may the type of land in question. And this includes land forming part of a common open space or allotment, listed buildings or land in a conservation area, ecclesiastical property and public highways. where a CPO includes land forming part of a common open space or allotment, then the order is to be the subject of a special parliamentary procedure unless the Secretary of State certifies one of three exceptions is met. Uh, these are first where exchange land is given, which is no less in area and equally advantageous as the land being taken. Secondly, where the land is being purchased to ensure its preservation or to improve its management. And thirdly, where the land is 250 square yards or less, or where it is for the winding or drainage of an existing highway and the giving of exchange land is unnecessary. In relation to exchange land, the new land should be vested in the same people as the land acquired and should be the subject to the same uh, rights. The Secretary of State should take into account various factors when considering the suitability of exchange land. These include its relatively, relative size and proximity, its character and features, the prospects of improvement that exist on the date of exchange, as well as the advantages of the exchange land. They don't need to be identical to the advantages of the land being acquired, but should overall be equal. Exchange land cannot be land already in public use for recreation because that would be disadvantageous to the public. Uh, and then finally, um, it should be noted that the definition of open space in section 19 of the 1981 Act includes disused burial grounds. And this gives rise to another question that must be asked, what about the bodies? In relation to disused burial grounds, consideration should be given to whether arrangements need to be made in order to ascertain whether there are in fact any human remains still present, 
and if so, how they will be removed. In the recent Midland Metro Order 2020, this was specifically dealt with. Uh, provision was made for public notification of the intended works so that the personal representatives of any deceased person would have an opportunity to undertake the removal of the remains. And if nobody came forward, provision was made for the acquiring authority to remove and reinter any remains in a suitable burial ground or cemetery. And importantly, provision was made for all of that to be recorded. And on that slightly morbid note, I bring my presentation to a conclusion and hand over to my colleague, Matthew Henderson. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much, David. So as Neil said at the start, uh, my talk today uh, is focusing on uh, the land acquisition strategy, a particular view on compensation and the uh, subtopic within that is looking in particular at neighbouring land and encouraging you to take a broad view at the start, oh I've gone too far, uh, a, a broad view at the start of um, what you may be faced with later down the line. So four topics all dealing with the issue of neighbouring land. Firstly, uh, Section 7 of the 1965 Act, dealing with severance and injurious affection where land is taken. Uh, Section 10, dealing where, with where land is not taken. Then looking at uh, the Land Compensation Act 1973, specifically Part 1, and compensation for the use of public works. And then finally touching on a topic which Ian uh, mentioned in his talk this morning, uh, around non-statutory blight schemes uh, and the scope for uh, being flexible uh, in your compensation approach there. So turning to the first of those topics, section seven of the 1965 Act, a very brief overview. So compensation is arising where firstly, uh, land has been acquired from the claimant. Secondly, a claimant has an interest in other land which was held with, and I highlight those two aspects which I'll come back to in a moment, the land which has been compulsorily acquired. And thirdly, the value of the claimant's other land uh, has been depreciated by either the severance uh, or the injurious affection as a result of that compulsory purchase. So severance, what do we mean here? Well, uh, I put up in that uh, first sub bullet point a, a definition from going back some time now to a 19th century case, indeed you can tell by the language, it's land separated from in the sense that it can no longer be treated as part of the subjects which until it's purchased uh, the landowner held with it. In real life though we need to uh, take this with a, a broad approach, so it includes for example uh, separation of horizontal, horizontal strata, for example uh, where you are uh, put it in a tunnel, but it also includes situations where the acquiring authority uh, is acquiring a new right over land and that acquisition of the right has the effect of depreciating the value. Now if we uh, just move on, uh, I said I'd pick up on these terms, so uh, when we talk about the injury, a factor which depreciates the value of the claimant's land, obvious examples include construction works, use of the acquired land, works being constructed on that acquired land. Uh, there's an important distinction here between section 7, which is when we're dealing with land which has been taken, section 10 land which has not been taken, and that is this, that section 7 is not limited to circumstances in which a right of action would have existed if the acquiring authority had not been acting under statutory powers, and as we'll see in section 10, that's a, an important precondition to that power. Uh, and then finally, highlighted section 44 of the 1973 Act, uh, dealing with the question of how do we assess compensation uh, and the assessment importantly is by reference to the works as a whole and that's even if the works are situated partly on the land acquired and partly elsewhere and clearly uh, going back to the, to the topic we're dealing with today, major infrastructure, that uh, spread across multiple parcels of land is something which is likely to arise. And then dealing finally with other land, uh, it's not simply a question of common ownership. Uh, it's a question of whether it is held therewith. What, what does that mean? It's something which is so connected with or related to the lands left with the owner of the latter that the owner is prejudiced in his ability to use or dispose of them by to, to his advantage, that is, by reason of the severance. So that requires you to, to, to look and to identify the prejudice and to identify the, uh, the, the reason uh, for that prejudice 
and to pinpoint that as being linked to the severance. In that approach, you need to look at matters widely. It's not simply uh, the case that it needs to be either in the same title or geographically contiguous, in just the same way that it doesn't have to be, uh, in just the same way that common ownership, as I've said before, is not sufficient. What's this telling us in terms of preparing the strategy at an early stage? Well, I think the key message is that you need to interrogate, and, and David made some very valid points here, interrogate the extent of the land which is being taken. Think about severance at an early stage. Consider that in, in both your scheme design, if it's possible, but also in, in, in your strategy as you take that forward. Then finally, dealing with uh, the question of compensation here, a couple of uh, a couple of introductory remarks. So firstly, it's, it's additional to the value of the land taken. Uh, secondly, it deals with the amount by which the value of the land is depreciated. Statutory rules which we're used to in respect to the assessment of the value of the land taken do not apply here. Uh, you can take a broader view, take into account anticipated future use, and that might include, as I put there in the, uh, in the fifth bullet point, consideration of depreciation and development value. And then the, possibly one of the essential issues to consider, especially in early stage in your uh, land strategy, is that of accommodation works. What work can be undertaken to lessen the effect of severance? A common example is, is building a bridge over the road, uh, allowing access to that land which has been severed, for example. But there's potentially uh, scope to be more creative there in terms of thinking about other mitigation, easy and obvious examples are around tree planting, noise barriers and buns. And the acquiring authority, whilst not under an obligation in any sense to uh, introduce these accommodation works, will want to give very careful thought to those works during the process of negotiation. Uh, and that, that's clearly something which works both ways and the landowner will also want to have careful regard to the scope for accommodation and for trying to negotiate such works from the land uh, from the acquiring authority uh, as well. So that's section seven. Turning now to section 10 of the 1965 Act. First point, the important distinction here to section seven, which we've just talked through, is that it's not involving uh, a situation where any land is taken. Again, it's, it's the value of the interest in the land which is depreciated as a result of the works which have been authorised. Two uh, important points that differentiate this from section 10. Firstly, the ability to exclude the rights of compensations. Uh, and secondly, different provisions in respect of development consent orders under the Planning Act 2008. I refer there to section 152, although it's fair to say that 152 introduces a, a very comparable provision to section 10. I've noted there the McCarthy rules, which will come into play uh, in this situation, I'm not going to go through them in, in detail in light of the time. But if we turn to think about the compensation, what's the basis? Well, it's the rules which apply to damages and tort, fairly straightforward and, and, and not surprising. It's an entitlement to compensation for all of the loss, which is the direct and foreseeable consequence of, of the authorising act. What does that include? Clearly, cost for repair being put back in a position as if. Uh, that one hadn't occurred, it could also potentially include diminution in value, but it's important to note that it doesn't entitle uh, any compensation for a, a ransom element. And, and equally important to note that betterment cannot be set off uh, unless there is a net, uh, an express statutory provision. And equally, you don't take mitigation steps into account. So all of these factors need to be given consideration early on um, when dealing with claims under section 10 or indeed potential claims under section 10. Turning then to uh, part one of the Land Compensation Act 1973. So we're dealing here with uh, public works. Just to put it in context, this, these sets of provisions were enacted to provide compensation where there's no right under section 7 or 10 of the 1965 Act, which I just talked through. A couple of prerequisites in order for the rights of compensation to arise. Firstly, depreciation the value of the claimant's interest in land. That depreciation, depreciation must be caused by physical factors. And I'll come back to uh, the question of physical factors in a moment. Those physical factors are caused directly, and I, I stress that, by the use of the public works, 
use of the public works is immune from an action in nuisance and that should often be in the uh, in the acquiring act itself uh, the claimant's interest qualifies correct time and manner of claim uh, broadly pr procedural in some respects and then finally the compensation exceeds 50 pounds so assuming that you're uh, you're ticking all of those boxes all of the prerequisites are established what then well just to touch on the physical factors so these are all defined section one of the 1973 act and i've given the list there all things which one would expect noise vibration etc importantly the source of those physical factors so the source of the noise or the source of the vibration must be situated on or in the public works and there's a particularly important exception to this uh, and that is in respect of aerodrome so physical factors caused by an aircraft arriving at or departing from an aerodrome shall be treated as caused by the use of the aerodrome whether or not the aircraft is within the boundary so the most common example of this is aircraft landing and taking off particularly in respect of noise possibly also to a lesser degree vibrational that's more likely to be on the ground during the period of, uh, of, of taxiing but certainly in respect of noise potentially covering a wide uh, scope and, and this highlights the importance when you're working up your scheme design of understanding what your noise envelope is what are the parameters and the areas uh, which are likely to be covered and need to be addressed finally public works that's also Define section one, subsection three, highways, aerodromes, or catch all any works or lands other than a highway or aerodrome provided or used in the exercise of statutory powers. And then also worth noting that the it's not simply on the uh, the initial uh, construction of the public works, but it can also include alterations. For example, uh, topically, in some respects, adding an additional runway. Uh, would very likely be such an alteration given rise uh, to a claim under uh, part one here. So what about the compensation? Uh, depreciation value in the claim of the claimant's interest, value assessed by reference to, amongst other things, the nature of the interest, the condition of the land, uh, and the date on the date of the service of the claim, and then the rules which were used to in, in two to four of the Land Compensation Act. Account has to be taken of the use of the public works as on the first claim day, and that, that's def that's defined in the app. But also, and importantly, of any intensification which might be reasonably expected. And then, in terms of early stage uh, considerations, of your strategy, this penultimate bullet point is particularly relevant. Account has to be taken of benefit of any soundproofing carried out or available. So, thinking early on in your scheme design, but also in your once it comes to preparing your land strategy. But what can we do in terms of uh, soundproofing and, and the like, which is, is going to assist in, in providing a benefit in these circumstances? And then setting off any increase in value attributable to the use um, of, the, of the public works. So turning then finally to the question of non-statutory blight schemes, which Ian touched on this morning, and Ian highlighted, I think entirely correctly, the importance of considering these schemes at an early stage. The, the real benefit of thinking about this in early stage is that there's a huge flexibility in scope. They are outside of the statute and you can target them quite specifically to the scheme which you have in question. They are very much bespoke. And in targeting them, you can take into account a wide range of factors. So for example, is there a particular uh, village or hamlet, let's say, that's uh, clearly going to be uh, affected and which is given rise to let's 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 assume lots of opposition to your scheme but we actually they, they probably do have whilst they may not fall within any of the statutory provisions they probably do have um, a valid point and in that respect can you make some provision for them on a voluntary basis which which will uh, at least to some degree assuage their concerns and ultimately help your scheme move forward in the overall picture particularly for example if you're dealing with uh, a DCO under the Planning Act 2008, are these people uh, going to turn up at, at your examination? Or actually, can you deal with a lot of their concerns at an early stage by engaging in a voluntary scheme and allowing yourself to be slightly more flexible in your approach, but ultimately for the greatest benefit um, of moving your project forward? So with that, I've, I've come to the end of my slides. I believe I'm handing back over now to Neil and we're going to have a, a series of questions and answers. Thank you very much to all the speakers. Um, I think 
David gets the award for overcoming glitches during the presentation. So uh, hold on to David for that and apologies for the loss of slides for a moment. Um, thank you very much for questions that you've asked. Um, we are going to uh, deal with some of them and apologies if we can't credit uh, you by name. Uh, we're told that we can't use people's uh, names. So I'm going to start off with uh, a question that we had which was, uh, what about relocation of businesses displaced? Uh, can one look to provide for relocation? Uh, and what's the possibility of using uh, land left over from the scheme for such relocation? And that raises a number of issues. I mean, first of all, I wonder to myself, should there be any land left over? Because you should only be acquiring the land that you need but it is often the case. And also, if you've taken land and you don't need it, uh, you probably, well, not probably, you should be offering it back to the original landowner, the whole Critchell-Down principle. Um, but can I turn to you, Ian, and ask you for your uh, view on this uh, question? First of all, how do you deal with business relocation in a practical way? And are there sometimes opportunities for uh, using land which turns out not to be needed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the critical aspect of any relocation is to understand it early enough in the process. So that is why optioneering at an early stage, engaging with land is, is, is so critical, because if you do have businesses which require relocation, um, and it's going to take a long time for that relocation to happen and finding alternative premises is going to be problematic or they've got a business which means that um, relocating is, is going to be very difficult. Unless you find that out in a timely fashion then that does introduce an impediment to your scheme. There is another element to it which is if you're looking at relocating pot potentially a facility that or, or um, building that might require um, a rule five equivalent reinstatement then looking at alternative sites and going through a, a land matrix to understand where that site might might be and satisfying the compulsory purchase test and securing planning consent for that relocation again all the all of that takes um, you know can take a long time and can you know threaten your your project program you do not want to be revealing those significant issues in, a, in inquiry or examination so my, my advice would be early engagement will try try and unpick those issues and work with those parties to try and reach a resolution a, a cost effective and timely resolution um, in respect of leftover land you're quite right if you are satisfying uh, tests then you should only be taking the land that is required for the scheme so there shouldn't be any land left over however there can be occasions perhaps where you've got a linear project where you're severing land and say two two neighboring farms and because of the linear nature of that land um, or, or that scheme re results in severed land it could be sensible or useful to to engage in a land swap because you've got two landowners either side uh, of that of, of that infrastructure. and if you can you can look to try and mitigate compensation liability by agreeing with the landowners a land swap but as you said leftover land is is not often uh, not often to be to, to to be found although i suppose you could on thinking of a major project like hs2 you can have land that's taken temporarily but it might that might mean 16 or 17 years and somebody although it's temporary acquisition may be prepared to give up that land and you might be able to use that later date but on the other hand if you waited for 16 or 17 years it's too late but yeah. on a shorter period it might be possible yes um anybody else who'd like to contribute on that subject or should we move on to another question david i just wonder if it's worth saying this going back to the point ian was making in terms of the overall strategy thinking about the question from a property point of view uh you're going to have to think about how you actually uh, terminate the business's right of occupation under the 1954 Act. That in itself can be a fairly lengthy process if it's a protected business tenancy. Uh, in terms of relocating, you may be able to rely on one of the grounds whereby the landlord has offered uh, 
and is willing to provide alternative accommodation, uh, you're more likely to rely on the redevelopment ground. Uh, but identifying all that sort of question at a very early stage is obviously highly significant in terms of the overall uh, strategy. And I would agree also with what Ian was saying about the understanding of the business early on. Clearly understanding the effect on the business is going to be essential to the question of compensation and, and how much later down the line. Um, so finding out about that early on, not being caught unaware is, is clearly an important stage in your strategy. Yes, but often easier said than done because it's difficult to know what the disturbance claim is going to be, uh, for example, at an early stage, although I'm sure that people like Ian uh, could manage that. Shall we move on to the next, uh, to another question, uh, which uh, somebody asks, uh, do you have any examples of what will be held to be unrealistic terms requested by a vendor? And I think that this is addressed at one of the points that David made. And we all know that compensation is meant to be based on the principle of uh, equivalence, uh, no more and no less. Um, but what happens if, and I'm going to turn to David in a moment, but what happens if you're at your uh, examination hearing or equivalent hearing and somebody says, well, I've offered to sell my land to the acquiring authority, um, but they won't accept my terms. So why should they be able to compulsorily acquire it? Now, of course, that hearing is not dealing with compensation, but it might drag one in uh, to issues of compensation. But when are terms unrealistic, uh, such as to justify going ahead with acquisition? Should we start with David and then perhaps go to Ian? Yeah, well, in terms of unrealistic terms, I think the only term of any significance uh, is going to be the purchase price. And I was particularly thinking of a vendor who is holding out for something way beyond anything they would possibly be entitled to in terms of uh, compensation. Um, another alternative might be uh, perhaps a vendor who, instead of holding out for an unrealistic purchase price, is perhaps seeking to shoehorn in uh, an overage provision or something like that. So perhaps they try to get the benefit of any uh, development, which is unlikely to be acceptable uh, to the uh, developer. Um, so th th those were the terms I particularly had in mind. Yeah. Ian, do you have a view on this from your experience of dealing with people on, on these acquisitions? I, I, no, I, th I think there's a, the, with a lot of these projects, there's a clear education piece for parties to understand the context in which negotiations are being undertaken. And there can be a lead in time to that as well. And that's where I think probably agents acting on behalf of claimants can add particular value if they're, they're satisfying the RICS um, a professional statement, which I, I mentioned in my presentation. But essentially, you're absolutely right, as you suggested, matters of compensation aren't going to be addressed or considered either at hearings or, or inquiries, and they are left to the upper tribunal lands chamber. But the key principle of valuation uh, under the compensation code is that um, those parties, the landowner should be no better and no worse off in consequence of the acquisition, um, the compulsory nature of the acquisition. Um, but again, that's, that is a, can potentially sometimes be a bit of an education piece with affected parties and, and briefing them on that. But it does direct you to ensuring that you've got a robust order trail of engagement and ensuring that um, you are trying to tie up as many matters as possible and you can demonstrate that it is only the matter of compensation which is outstanding. Yeah, thank you. Um, can I just, there's one I think for uh, you uh, David but others may also like to contribute. Um, you mentioned special categories of land and in particular open space and you went into some detail on uh, disused burial grounds. Um, I think in a case which I'm uh, familiar with where we had an issue of a tram line going uh, through that uh, disused burial ground. That's how we dealt with it. Um, but how far do you think that promoters should go um, to seek to find exchange land uh, when promoting acquisition of land forming part of an open space. 
I mean, I've always taken the view that one should try and avoid special parliamentary procedure if one possibly can. That comes from the experience. Um, first time that I appeared in Parliament was on a special parliamentary procedure and um, the scheme which had been waived through the compulsory purchase process uh, was derailed in Parliament. And it was a fortunate case for my clients, but uh, from that experience, I've always warned promoters, avoid special parliamentary procedure if you possibly can. Uh, and so you should go to quite extensive lengths to either avoid open space or to provide uh, suitable land in exchange. But what other views do people have? Uh, well, Neil, I, I would certainly agree with that. I think uh, anything to do with Parliament is best avoided in all circumstances, particularly those that you've just described. But uh, re here, really, I think unless the promoter can be confident that uh, one of the other two exceptions may apply, uh, so where land is less than a certain size or it's being uh, required for widening or, or drainage or it's being purchased to secure its preservation or to improve its management. And it's your, it's your confident you're going to fit in with one of those two uh, exceptions, uh, then I, I agree with you, uh, Neil, that you, you should uh, go as far as possible to try and identify that exchange land in order to avoid um, the, the potential adverse consequences that you've, you've mentioned. Right, I think we might now move on to, uh, we probably going over our uh, allotted hours time, but uh, another question uh, that somebody's asked, uh, which is this, following initial engagement, a business finds a building to move to and is keen to do so now. Uh, at what stage can a promoter say no because it's too early? Um, I think this is probably one for you here. And my uh, initial response is that hopefully if you've set your land acquisition strategy properly, the promoter is in a position to acquire land at an early stage. Even if the scheme hasn't progressed very far, if it's clear that the land's going to be needed, it would be very sensible for the promoter to engage and to have allocated resources to make that possible. But, but Ian, what's your view? Yeah, so I think that's absolutely right. So if, what will be, each, each project is going to be slightly different. So it's difficult to talk in general terms, but there will be circumstances where there will be an opportunity to make an early acquisition, which will make, um, obviously sense in terms of compensation because you can you can limit or minimize your compensation liability which would otherwise be inflated if, if that business was to relocate at a later date but also by removing that business as an objector you're de-risking the consenting uh, uh, stage of the of the project however each project will have its own uh, milestones and it will also have to go through various um, gates for authority um, so in terms of answering that question, question uh, properly the, the, there's, the, there's no responsibility unless the land is statutory blighted and you know a business could submit a blight notice there's no obligation on an acquiring authority to acquire early except for it needs to satisfy the test at examination or acquiry but put, but looking at these items within the strategy should you should be looking to resolve these matters and, and an early acquisition where it makes compensation and consenting sense should definitely be looked at but obviously projects are often running at risk until they 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 must get to a stage where they've secured all the funding they need so there can often be um, concerns about early acquisitions in that respect right um Thank you very much. I think we probably, uh, well, we have exceeded the allotted hour. We'll probably draw it to a close then. Uh, we haven't been able to answer all the questions, but thank you very much, everybody, for those questions. Um, there was a very interesting question about compensation um, and how it should be measured and whether open market value is the right approach. And what I'm going to suggest is, remember that this is just the first in a series of uh, on uh, major infrastructure projects and we'll be moving on later
to a, a session devoted to compensation and that may be or, or to compensation related issues that may be the time to raise that so tune back in again thank you very much indeed to our panel of speakers if we were all able to clap i'd invite you to do so but we won't hear you so um don't bother um but um thank you very much to ian especially as a guest um and to david and to matt and i think the value of this exercise for me certainly is seeing all the different perspectives because we've seen ian as a surveyor david as a mainly property practitioner um and then matt uh, having a, a planning and compulsory purchase type practice amongst other things. So thank you very much indeed to all our speakers. Thank you to all who've joined us and um, we look forward to seeing you at the next uh, session in this series. Bye.